Praise the name of the Lord. Brother J.P. Timmons here of Christ Church International. Coming to you on this beautiful Lord's Day, October the 27th. Year of our Lord, 2024. <clears throat> Hope you're having a blessed Lord's Day. We are. Having beautiful weather here in Colorado where I am. And we're looking forward to all the things that God's going to do in the new year and I have a message on my heart from strong from the Lord. Um, actually put it there yesterday morning when I awakened, which is pretty common. Um, you know, I'm a spiritual scientist. I'm always interested in people's spiritual gifting and how they pray and different things. And, you know, we're all different. We all have different spiritual gifts, but very often I'll awake during the night or in the morning and I'll have something in my spirit pretty strong from the Lord. And, I, and this was yesterday, but I always like to meditate on it. And then I make notes and I type them out. And <clears throat> that's what I do to make these videos to help you and to bless you and this one will certainly help you and bless you if you will pay attention to it and it's not the kind of thing you hear much of today unfortunately because most of the church has become apostate as prophesied in the scriptures so our website's www.ccipublishing.net and our email address is Christ underscore church underscore INT at yahoo.com. <clears throat> if you have some issues in your life, you need help, whatever, you can email us. And we encourage you to go on the website and order our books and Bibles to help you in your Christian walk, to strengthen you and help you in these last days because we're in. The last of the last days, I think most of us know that. We've, we've sensed that for some time, that, that things really changed a few years ago. It's like a shift. You know, I hate to use that word because so many, people, so many prophetic people use that word in, in a nonsensical way. <laughs> Everything's a shift, but uh, we did sense a shift that that uh, things were speeding up and we're close to the end of time and we're close to the return of the Lord. And we got a real strong sense. You need to get everyone into the ark, which is Jesus Christ, his, his blood sacrifice uh, as soon as possible. And the mark of the beast will soon be upon us and the church will be raptured and bad things are coming. So praise God we're we serve a great king, we serve a great God, and the title of this message is Jehovah Jireh. And, you know, we used to sing that song, especially back in the 70s and 80s, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Well, you don't hear it much anymore, but it's still true. And that scripture comes from the book of Genesis with Abraham when he was asked to sacrifice his only begotten son. And of course, it, it's Hebrew, and it means the Lord, my provider. And he is our provider. He's, you know, God told me in 1985, the main reason he left the Bible was to meet the needs of mankind. And so you need to study the scriptures. You need to meditate in the scriptures, and you need to, you need to give the Lord scriptures for what your needs are. But he is your provider, and he never changes. And uh, we're going to be talking about some of the ways Satan leads people astray and how people get off track. And uh, some of them even lose their salvation because they get off track and and begin to begin to worship the devil in, in different ways and become idolaters. And so this is what's on the heart of the Lord, that you, he doesn't want anyone to perish. And he he wants you to understand that he's obligated by covenant to provide for you. And so don't, don't get into sin because maybe there's some lack in your life right now. 
Don't get over into sin and fall away from the Lord. You know, trust the Lord. My book, Mysterious Secrets, I list one of the weapons of our warfare is trust. You know, God told me back in 1998 that he didn't have very many people he can trust. And I certainly understand that with what's going on in the church today. It's there's so much nonsense and so much as I'm going to talk about today, pursuit after wealth. So you need to get close to the Lord and you need to follow the Lord. You need to, to be a disciple. You need to be disciplined. People don't want to be disciplined today. I mean, and even in households, the fatherly discipline is, is frowned upon. And so people don't want to be disciplined. Well, i got news for you. God disciplines us. It's in the scriptures. And he says you're an illegitimate father if you don't discipline your children. But people don't want to be disciplined. They just want to live a happy, wealthy life with no problems. And and uh, as the Holy Spirit told me in Africa years ago, they don't care whether they get it from him or from the devil, their healing or their finances or whatever. It's a very dangerous mindset to have. But I want to talk to you today about how it can come about because I've seen it. And I've seen a parallel here with the prosperity message as it's preached. I mean, I always say that. The gospel of the kingdom is a gospel of prosperity, but it's not the way it's preached. Listen, the number one, don't ever forget this. I haven't said this in a long time, but I have said it a lot. If you read church history, which you should do, the number one, number one sign of a false teacher or a false prophet or whatever in the early church was a preoccupation with money. And I have to tell you, most churches today, that's what their preoccupation is, money. So what does that tell you? It would certainly tell the early fathers something. So, as I said, our message today is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Oh, is he ever our provider. Our scriptures, which I'm not going to read, but a few of them, but I want you to write them down and, and study and meditate on them. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. 1 Kings 17, 1 through 8, and I talk about that a lot. The place called there. Getting rid of something on this computer over here. Keeps popping up. So, 1 Kings, the place called there. You know, God will provide for you, but you need to be in the place called there. And then uh, 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, we see a couple of examples. Uh, God provided the oil for the widow. Uh, and Hebrew tradition says that that widow of the sons of the prophet was Obadiah's wife. You know, Obadiah was the one who hid prophet in, prophets in caves by 50s during the days of Jezebel. And and uh, and anyway, Hebrew tradition says he's the one that died there and then God provided through multiplying that oil, didn't he? And then many other, many other examples. You know, the word says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses let everything be established. And so this principle of Jehovah Jireh, God being our provider is throughout scripture. It's I could give you probably a hundred scriptures. Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9, which is a prayer of Agur. We never hear anybody talk about that. We're going to talk in length about it. Matthew 6, 19 through 34, that's our key text. You can underline that or highlight it. Luke 3, 10 and 11, Acts 2, 42 through 45. And chapters 4, 34 through 37, and then Romans 1, 16 through 17. Praise God. You know, the word of God is true, and God is not a man that he should lie. And he is our provider. 
and he's obligated by covenant to provide. He taught me that back in 1996, and then we saw people healed of terminal cancer one after another, bang, bang, bang. We had a few days to live with that principle. I woke this morning, this was yesterday, with it strong in my spirit, the fact that so many in the church don't understand or believe the Bible and don't know I am. What did he say to Moses? When Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? Tell him I am sent you. And I shared with my pastor, John Osteen, back in the 70s and for many decades now, and you'll see it on our website if you go there and read our beliefs and stuff, which you should, for many decades now, that the greatest thing I've learned about Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit, is that they truly are the great I am. They are who you believe by faith for them to be. Savior, healer, provider, etc. So you can you can believe, you can read the word and believe Jesus is your Savior and be born again. But that doesn't mean he's going to heal you automatically. He might. But you need to learn who Jesus the save the healer is. And the same thing where where finances are concerned or anything else that you're believing him for. Watch that video, The Three Steps to Receiving a Miracle, or you can read, a, read the article on our website. It's the same thing. When Jesus appeared to me, and three step, gave me three steps to receiving a miracle. And you could use those three steps. You know, you see in Scripture that, that all, of these, all of these promises are appropriated the same way. You find a promise in the word. You believe by faith. You confess that promise, that word. You confess it over and over by faith. Or hopefully you find several promises. And then you ask God to conform it or confirm it, which he will do. He confirms his word with signs following. Mark 16 or Jeremiah 1 12, the Old Testament. I watch over my word to perform it. And he'll perform it for you. And remember what I say all the time. When will God heal me, Brother Tim? Well, he's already healed you. You may not see the manifestation. You may see it right away. We've seen it right away many times in our own lives and others. But you might not see it for years. Your part is to believe. You don't tell God how to do it, and you don't tell him when to do it. Your part is to believe, and you say it until you see it. You see, that is the prayer, prayer of faith. Like James talks about, the prayer of faith will save the sick. Well, where's the prayer of faith? It's in Mark eleven twenty three. And then Mark 20, 11, 24 is the confession of faith. So we pray the prayer of faith and we also say the confession of faith of the word, the word, the word, the word. It won't return void. Isaiah 55, it won't return void, but it will surely accomplish that for which I have sent it, says the Lord. Praise God. He is our provider. He'll provide for you. I'm just telling you strongly today, your problem is you're looking around or you're wondering. You've entered, as my friend Norval Hayes used to say, you've entered the land of wondering. Well, I wonder when Jesus is going to do this, and I wonder when Jesus is going to do that, and I wonder if, 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 or what. That's doubt, my brother and sister. That's not faith. And the word says the just shall live by faith, and it says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And why did Jesus say all the time, your faith has made you well, your faith has made you whole, your faith, your faith has healed you. We have to believe the word. We have to bring the word to him and say, look, this is what you said. This is what you wrote. And he'll perform it for you. He's obligated by covenant. <laughs> Get that down strong today. 
So they are who you believe by faith for them to be. If you believe he's your savior, praise God, you'll be saved. You stay out of sin, continue to believe in the word and live a holy, godly life. Then when you die, you'll go to heaven. But that doesn't mean the devil might not kill you early with some terminal disease. But that mean he might not put diabetes on you. Or as that cat says on YouTube, diabetes. <laughs> we, we found that. We think it's so funny. It's only about 10 seconds or so. <laughs> diabetes. They are who you believe in them to be. So, so many today are chasing after wealth and riches, a bigger house, or more, more, more thinking that this is prosperity when it isn't. I prophesied in a church in Tulsa back in 2012, and it broke my heart. Jesus said, my people don't want to eat the bread of life anymore. They want to become rich. They don't want to eat the bread of life. <sighs> That's the work of Satan, my brother and sister. That's what I want to share, something I learned when I went abroad to Nigeria in a moment. Even in ministry, wealth is paraded as a substitute for success in ministry in favor with God. Oh, he's got four airplanes and five houses, so God's really blessing him. And, and, and then you find out, you know, he's got five wives too or some other... He's living in sin, and, and, and so, you know, that's not the work of the Lord. It's the work of manipulation and witchcraft. Look at T.B. Joshua. You know, I've been on that program, Freedom to the Captives, a couple of times. He had people coming from all over the world, gave him millions and millions of dollars, and yet he was a false prophet, and uh, he, he was practicing juju from what people say who were in that, who were under that for so long. And I saw it right away when they told me some of the things. They should have recognized that was Juju. That was not the Lord. But that's another subject. So they paraded wealth as a substitute for success, which is contrary to Scripture. And this has troubled me for many years because it has, it has perverted the family of God and the family the young eagles are raised in. This has been my biggest, my biggest uh, concern is for the young eagles. They see Mr. or Mrs. Big Name Ministry and they think that's how it's supposed to be done. And that's success when you have your Gulfstream 4 or whatever. Well, is that what the word says? No, it doesn't. Jesus said you can't serve God in money. So you have to choose. Which one are you going to serve? And people get deceived into thinking they're still serving God. And Satan switches them off to where they're really only serving money. And that's idolatry. And if you pursue that path, you'll end up in hell. I'll tell you right now. There are sins of commission you can commit and go to hell, and there are sins of omissions, or, or, uh, yeah, sins of sins of omission, uh, spiritual sins, and and the and the two main ones are idolatry and unforgiveness, that are taught in the scriptures. So. God doesn't want you following that route. Many ministers, especially in Africa, they've gotten into this selling this water. And we've had one guy here, Peter Popoff, who was exposed years ago. A fake, fake ear, he had an earpiece. He was faking the word of knowledge that he knew stuff about people. And he was exposed on national television. He's still doing it, selling miracle spring water. There is no such thing, my brother and sister. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. Don't be deceived. What Jesus say about the last days is about deception. But this has troubled me for many years because you see, my brother and sister, 
Your model of the family is the one you're raised in. And we're talking about a physical family. And whenever I counsel, if I marry a couple and I counsel them, I always go through this because the biggest problem people have when they marry is expectations. Because the husband's model of the family is always different than the wife's. And they need to understand that. And the same thing's true spiritually. Remember I say all the time, spiritual things are like physical things. What you see as a spiritual family, your model is often wrong. And we see it throughout scriptures. We see Elijah's ministry model. You don't see it in the church. The ministry model most people follow is wrong. It's not scriptural. So you need to examine the family and the church that you're in. You need to examine it and compare it with the scriptures. Don't just believe what I'm telling you. You know, maybe I'm wrong in some. If I, you ever find me wrong in an area, write me. Let me know. I'll correct it. But I watch myself pretty close. And I am anointed as a teacher, and I know these things from the Holy Spirit. So just remember, your model of the family should be based on the Word and not what you see. Amen? And wealth is not the measure. The Holy Spirit told me that in 1997. He said, don't, don't ever judge a church or a ministry by how big it is, how much money they have, or how many people they have. You only judge it by the anointing. And I've found that normally the, the bigger the church is, the less, the less it's probably going to be a genuine church. It's going to be polluted and controlled by Satan. Because most churches are controlled by Satan. So let's read our key text for this teaching from the lips of the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Wonderful teaching he gave. We're going to begin in verse 19 and read through 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. I got five cars, I got 12 houses. I got this, I got that. Look how God has blessed me. Well why, well, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? It says right here, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Underline that. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your heart's turned toward things on the earth, maybe you're an idolater. Maybe you need to check up on yourself based on what Jesus is saying here. If you have a preoccupation with money, maybe you need to check up on yourself and you need to pray and you need to repent. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Or mammon, the King James says, but it's actually money. Therefore, I tell you. In other words, this is the, this is the world system. I've just told you about the world system. But because of that, I tell you, when you... You know the old saying, if you see a therefore, you need to find out why it's therefore. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, 
or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? I can't tell you how strong this was in my spirit yesterday. So many people are doing this today, and they're going to be doing it more in the days ahead when famine begins to hit and other things. Trust the Lord. He will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. That's why he wants to give you this message so you won't fall away. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. You know, in Solomon's day, gold and silver were as common as wood is today, or steel, or or thing. It, it, it was, you know, Solomon had tremendous wealth, and yet Jesus says he wasn't that that he wasn't even clothed like the lilies of the field. Oh, you of what little faith! Remember what I say. The Lord told me in 1980 the power of the devil is going to become so strong in the last days. And only those Christians that are strong in faith and the word will survive. So you need to increase your faith. You need to buy Living in the Now Faith and order it from our bookstore, online bookstore. O ye of little faith, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, and don't we see that all the time? We do today, because we're living in the last days. When John the Baptist began his ministry by preaching the gospel of the kingdom, what did he say? Quote, he that has two coats, give one to he who has none, etc. In other words, he who has more gives to him who has a lack. And that's what we see in the book of Acts where they took up offerings. The offerings weren't for their ministry. We don't ever see one single time Paul took up an offering for his ministry. I'm sorry, it ain't there. He received the offerings, but it's for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And he talks about it in Corinthians Chapter 8, 2 Corinthians. Because that was the model we see in the early church. Those who had lack received from those who had extra, like here. So what does that tell you? It's part of the gospel of the kingdom. If you have two coats, give it to someone who doesn't have a coat. Now, they should be in the body of Christ preferentially unless the Lord tells you otherwise, you know, we take care of our own and then we take care of people in the world. <clears throat> like I give to the missions, the Pueblo missions here. And I go over there and give coats to people and things, but, but most of them have been born again. So we give to those that are in need. We, we help the poor. Along with Jesus' words in Matthew, the scripture that was in my, that was the one I read in Matthew 6. The scripture that was in my spirit this morning was Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. But before I read it, I want to contrast it with the prayer of Jabez found in 1 Chronicles 4.10. I'm going to read that now. If you're been around very long or been a Christian very long, you're probably familiar 
with the prayer of Jabez. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother named him Jabez and said, quote, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez called out to the God of Israel, quote, If only this is his prayer, if only you will bless me, extend my border, let your hand be with me, and keep me from harm, so that I will not cause any pain. And God granted his request. It's pretty incredible that Bruce Wilkinson wrote a book years ago. It sold over 10 million copies. It was a bestseller, obviously. It was titled The Prayer of Jabez, Breaking Through to the Blessed Life, or Blessed Life, however you want to pronounce it. Breaking Through. We hear that word breakthrough a lot. I think I first heard it from, from Rod Parsley. Breakthrough. Do you, let me ask you a question. I have the eagle question right here. It's not in my notes. I have the eagle question. Do you need to break through to the blessing? Do you need to? Does anybody need to? Do I need to? Does every Christian need? Is there some magic formula that you need to break through to the blessing? Breaking through to the blessed life. Kenneth Copeland, Joel Osteen, and many others. You know, Joel Osteen wrote a book years ago, Your Best Life Now. Many others have written books slanted toward the blessing. Brother Copeland wrote a book called The Blessing, and I read it. And in fact, I gave it to somebody. The Blessing and How You Can Receive It. Yet nobody has written a book or preached a sermon on Agur's prayer found in Proverbs 30. Now let's read that. The prayer of Agur in Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you, don't deny them to me before I die. Keep falsehood and deceitful words far from me. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me with the food I need. In this sort of like the Lord is my shepherd, I'm going to trust him to feed me with the food I need. Instead of following some formula and confessing the Cadillac cars and houses and all that stuff that they teach you from that uh, school of wisdom up there in Fort Worth. <laughs> I wonder sometimes how that's, how that's wise. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me with the food I need. Otherwise, I might have too much and deny you. Isn't that what we see throughout scriptures when they get too much? When Israel got too much over and over, they turned to the Baals or some other God or whatever. I might have too much and deny you saying, who is the Lord? Or I might have nothing and steal, profaning the name of my God. When you commit sin like stealing, you're profaning the name of the Lord God. So to me, I think the prayer of this prayer is much more spiritual and much more what we need in the church than the prayer of Jabez. Very often God will give you something you keep asking for and he'll give it to you. Doesn't mean it's good for you. Doesn't mean it's you know, what does it say? He asked that he be blessed. And I've shared many times. If you do, if you follow what Jesus taught, you'll be blessed automatically. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. What things? The things that you need. Praise God, praise God. And remember what I say all the time, quote, the only true picture we have of the church is in the book of Acts. Satan moved quickly to pervert the gospel of the kingdom 
and destroy the true churches and erect false churches preaching another gospel. That's why the Lord had me write that book, Another Gospel. You need to read it. So many false gospels out there. Notice from our scriptures given earlier in Acts an important distinction between the church of Acts and the church today. Listen closely. Holy Spirit told me this yesterday. Notice the distinction between the church of Acts, which is the church he birthed in AD 33, the church of Acts and the church today. In the church the Holy Spirit established, people were seeking to give away give away houses and property to provide for those in the church who had a need. Whereas today, it's the exact opposite, isn't it? The prosperity gospel, as it's preached, wants you to get a bigger house or car or more finances. See that perversion? In my book, Another Gospel, I discuss how the Holy Spirit taught me that the best way to distinguish the genuine gospel from any false gospel is that all of the false gospels are sensual in nature. Now, don't forget this part. If they're sensual in nature, they're also temporary, since everything that is sensual is only temporary. So, yeah, you might have wealth in this life, the witches have theirs up in the spirit realm, above the earth. They can be poor here, but rich there. It's temporary. They won't have it for eternity. What you store up in heaven, that was Jesus' counsel. Don't store up wealth here. Store it up in heaven. And you'll be rich. He told a rich young ruler, you lack one thing. Sell all you have. Now, he may not say that to you. He's never said that to me, but I'd do it. I'd do it in a New York minute because I believe the Bible. Back in 1990, the Lord gave me a very long prophetic word concerning ministry. And in it, he said, quote, you go abroad and you see these things and you come back here, that is to America, and you see the same thing and you say, why can't people see? Why can't they understand? And what he meant by that was in Africa, agents of the devil are in churches. And they're here too, but people don't know it. And those agents will convince, for example, a jobless Christian to drink some special water and they'll get a job. So they do this and Satan provides them with a job or finances, which eventually results in their leaving the church for the occult. Here it's often the prosperity gospel that causes people to lose their focus on Jesus and the Great Commission and just begin to seek money for money's sake. And what did Jesus say? You cannot serve God and money, so you must choose. Usually people that are rich toward God, as he said, the man who built the bigger and bigger barns because he couldn't store them, he, he wasn't rich toward God and he died and went to hell. Because Satan is very good and very adept. He knows the human soul and he knows ways to trap you and move you a little at a time away from the Lord and the true gospel to a false gospel, a false prosperity gospel, where the next thing before you know it, you're just worshiping money. Then you become stingy. There's a stingy spirit that gets a hold of people. So Jesus said, you cannot serve God in money, so you must choose either God or money. The Lord taught me a very important principle of his covenant back in 1996 that has confirmed throughout the Bible, and I've given you some specific examples in the scriptures for this teaching. That principle is, he is the great I am. 
And part of the I am is that he is Jehovah Jireh, your provider, your provider. God is obligated by covenant to provide for you. Just get that straight once and for all. He doesn't want you to get into sin that can damage you or even send you to hell because idolatry will send you to hell because you don't understand this principle. We get emails every week from people, especially in Africa, who are experiencing lack in their lives. Well, the fact is, if you're experiencing lack in your life, it must be for one of three reasons. Number one, the Lord is not your shepherd because the word says, everybody in the world knows Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So if you got one in your life, the Lord's not your shepherd. Amen? It's that, it's that simple. You might say, well, that's Old Testament. Yeah, it is. But there's many other scriptures in both the Old and the New Testament that confirm that. And plus the fact that Jesus said in Malachi, I am the Lord, I, am the Lord, I change not. So the Lord never changes. Number two, it's because there's unrepented sin in your life. And this is very often the case. People in ministry have unrepented. They have sin. I don't understand it. I, I really, I don't get it. How they can be living in some kind of sin and then think, think it's okay or that they're special because I'm Mr. Big Name Ministry. I can do, it's just been over and over and over again throughout the years and even more so recently with some big name ministries that I knew by the Spirit over 20 years ago that they had some issues there. I could tell. But number two, if there's unrepentant sin in your life, listen, you're not fooling God. You might fool a few people, but you're not fooling God. You need to repent. Stay out of sin. You die in that condition, you won't go to heaven. You'll lose everything. Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And how can he stand in the pulpit on Sundays and preach? There's unrepented dark sin in your life. Or it's like number three, you're like Job, you're under a spiritual attack from Satan. Regardless of which one of these three, however, the Lord wants you to draw close to him, not turn away. Fast and pray the scriptures that cover your case, and he will surely turn things around. He doesn't want you falling into sin by trying to change things yourself. You know, my brothers and sisters, I've learned being in ministry, so many people, they don't have pure hearts. They have hidden sin in their lives. When we lived in Montana, nobody in, the, nobody in our church ever wanted to go hunting with me or go out, you know, track or anything, spend the night because I knew by the Spirit they, were, they didn't want to be around me that long because they figured God's going to show them some things, some sin in their life. Well, I already knew it. You know, when you, when you, when you, you have a pure heart and you minister for the Lord and you, you're his under shepherd, he shows you things about people. We had two women in our church there and, and, and they went to the casino and, it, and you know, it might be okay for you to go to the casino. It would be, it'd be okay for me to go to the casino, it'd be okay, but it wasn't okay for them because they got into trouble there. You know, we have a, we have a friend that's a very, actually a, a relative who was in ministry and, 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 and she got divorced, and then she goes to a bar. I, if I told her, I said, you don't, what, what business did you have going to a bar? I mean, she got into, a, you know, she, she committed sexual sin. And I said, you don't have any business going into a bar. What does the word say? Give no place to the devil. What are you doing? But a lot of times people don't want to be around you because they think God's going to expose sin. He's already exposed it. We had a, another young woman in our church up there. When the Lord showed me, I was over in Oregon. And, and frankly, I, I didn't believe it because I knew her. I spent a lot of time in Evelyn had. She stayed at our house. She was single. And I just couldn't believe she would be in, uh, in that kind of sin. But she was. 
She was. So God shows you these things. So be quick to repent. How often do I tell you that? You're not fooling anybody. If you have a really godly pastor who prays for you and seeks the will of the Lord for your life and upholds you before God, then God's going to show you things. He's going to show them things about you. And you should ask their counsel. Don't just do things. You know, my, my own sister, uh, she, when, when she got married, I mean, the Lord told me, yeah, she can marry him, but he, he's not going to live very long. And he didn't. He didn't live very long. So God lets you, he'll let you have your own will if you want it. But if you have godly counsel, listen to it. Find people you can trust. Find people who aren't goofy, or who aren't self-seeking, who don't have pride, who aren't after money. Money, 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 money. Like I tell John all the time. Money, 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 money. So those three things. He doesn't want you falling into sin by trying to change things yourself. He wants you to turn to him. If there's sin in your life, Repent. Please repent, repent, turn away, turn around. Doesn't mean, to repent doesn't mean I'm sorry and you keep doing it. Repent means you change things. That's like turning around and going a completely different direction. It's not saying I'm sorry and continuing in the same direction. I repent. It means I turn around. I've judged myself. I won't have to be judged by the Lord. He doesn't want you falling into sin by trying to change things yourself. Turn to him. Fall on the mercy seat. Mercy seat with repentance and tears. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember today that Jehovah Jireh is obligated by covenant to provide for you. You are important to God and you're loved. He taught me that principle back in 1990. Six, when he sent me to the Philippines to rescue one 22-year-old girl who was fixing to marry somebody the Lord didn't want her to marry. Imagine that. Imagine that. But it taught me a lesson. I mean, I did it, and she was rescued, and praise the Lord. She's living back here now, and, have, and we've had her at meetings giving a testimony she lives up in uh, in uh, <clears throat> in the Portland area, but she was under a spell. But that taught me the value of one single person to God. You know, we have a tendency to think, there's, "Well, there's what nine billion people in the world, or whatever it is, and then there's billions more that have passed before." that I'm somehow not important. No, you're, you're very important. God created you for a purpose. Don't ever let the devil tell you you're not important. So remember, you're important to God. He will provide for you. No matter what comes, he will provide for you. And remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees, a clear example of this in Luke 15 about leaving the 99 sheep to seek the one. That was an example of that scripture. He sent me over there to rescue the one. Jesus cares about the one. Seek his face. Repent of any sin. Draw close to him. He will provide. Confess the scriptures. If there's lack in your life in any way, confess those scriptures each day. And then when he provides, don't forget to give him thanks. Don't forget to give him thanks. Remember the 10. There's only one that returned to give thanks. That was the Samaritan. Jesus said, weren't 10 of you healed? But only one returned. So much ungratefulness in the church. I prophesied at a church in Helena when we lived up there. 
and the, and the church didn't like it, and the pastor didn't like it. But God said, you, you bring me this long laundry list of things you're, you're believing, you're, you're praying for, save my sister and do, you know, this, this. And he says, I do one, two, and three. And instead of thanking me for that, you say, you don't even thank me for that. You say, well, what about, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10? We have a tendency to be ungrateful. Don't ever be ungrateful. Always be thankful for what God provides. He is your provider. So give him thanks today. He's given you eternal life if you're in the kingdom. And if you're not, you need to be. If you don't know how to be, you can write us. If you don't, if you can't find a church to guide you, write us. We'll tell you exactly what to do or how to get the eye of the eagle. We have videos and written teachings on these things. Baptism or Baptism of power, baptism in the Holy Ghost, as Pentecostals call it. You need that. So thank the Lord today for all he's done for you and all he's going to do. And trust him. He is Jehovah Jireh. Praise God. We, we found in our own lives, you know, the Lord tarries will go the way of all the earth. And we found, like Joshua said, not one of his promises has ever failed. Not one has ever failed. Praise God. So I thank God for his word. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I thank the Holy Spirit for sealing this up in your heart today. May you be blessed this week in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>